Click. Hi, David. Hi, Bob. How, How are you doing? doing? All, All right, right, thank you. How are things in Washington? Muggy and unpleasant. It's August. Hey, listen, uh, I don't want to suggest that you've got less to complain about than I do, but my, my uh, air conditioning... Uh, it's been out for about two weeks. I mean, there, there's a uh, oh. the motor for our air conditioner is supposedly being transported uh, from the uh, Midwest somewhere, and I think that the, the people in charge of it are the people who were in charge of the post-war uh, occupation in Iraq or something. It's just not not going as we had hoped. Well, I, I once had a landlord who um, told me that a an air conditioner window air conditioner used as much power as I forget now what it was. Uh, he he died with a fortune of eight hundred million dollars, though, so he must have known what he was talking about. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I... But he was still letting up the second floor of his house. It was a very... <laughs> well, I'd settle for a window unit right now, believe me. Um, the, the, uh, well, well, thanks for coming back. Um, Thank you. Uh, you are, uh, you're at the American Enterprise Institute, right. uh, which, uh, of course, uh, opponents of the Iraq War have long referred to as the axis of evil, uh, a, 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 a kind of um, a catchy phrase, I've always thought. An homage. Uh, and, and, and I should say, I should say, actually, that, that uh, among the things we're going to talk about here today, you know, you were, of course, on with, uh, with Eli Lake, uh, mm -hmm. who, who, who is a little uh, closer to you ideologically than I am, I guess it's fair to say. Um, well, we were, a little, we were a little worried it would turn out to be like a debate in the Senate, you know, my learned friend, my distinguished colleague. <laughs> well, you, you were pretty polite. I, I actually hope to keep up the politeness. <clears throat> I'm getting better and better at that as I get older. Um, and... Uh, but Eli, but, but Eli had the good journalistic instincts uh, to ask you about, uh, you, of course, you're, you're well known for helping to draft the famous Axis of Evil speech, and, and um, Eli, uh, uh, I thought, wisely asked you, the, you know, for, to, to mount a little defense of the phrase. Some of our commenters thought that, that uh, perhaps it would be nice for, for you to be interrogated by, by, by somewhat, someone from a somewhat more adversarial stance, I guess. So yeah. I wanted to do a little of that up front. Um, and then move into your book, uh, An End to Evil, uh, your ambitiously titled uh, book, um, co-authored with Richard Pearl, and then, and then uh, uh, and, and, so, and some ideas uh, t that show up toward the end of that that, that, that maybe uh, are not so different from, from some ideas I, I favor, and, um, and then get into some other things. So uh, okay. I, I really appreciate Great. you coming on. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to oh, be here, well. so, uh, so I'll take it away. Okay, okay. Uh, well, for starters, you know, I'm curious, uh, what, is, what does the word evil mean to you? Well, the, the, President Bush started using the word e evil and evildoers in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks as a kind of response, to, in many ways, to a very practical problem he had, which is, what do you call these terrorists? Um, that these are terrorists who acted in the name of Islam. He did not want to call them Islamic terrorists for some pretty obvious reasons. Um, and he gravitated to the use of this phrase, evildoers, for two reasons. Um, one is, uh, it resonated with him. Um, he, uh, one of his favorite psalms, the psalmist talks about being surrounded by evildoers. But more important, it, it translated very powerfully into Arabic. Um, remember, jihad, which is a negative word to us, was, regard was we were warned, was a po po positive word in the Middle East. Um, and in the Islamic legal tradition, they distinguish between jihad, which is a sacred war, a proper war, and wrongful war, needless war, um, and a wicked war. And he was looking for a word that would translate not as mujahideen, that is a, someone who wages a jihad, but as somebody who wages one of these kinds of wrongful wars. And evildoers seem to meet the bill. And so that language, which the president used almost from the very beginning, stuck. That was the language that, that used. It was imprecise. Um, it had a lot of drawbacks to it, but it was thought to have a lot of advantages, too. Okay. And, and can I ask you, I mean, tell me if you're not at liberty to elaborate too much, but, I mean, I've heard, I've heard different reports about your role um, in crafting uh, the, the phrase axis of evil. Of course, any presidential speech is a collaborative effort, and, it, you know, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like writing for the movies. What's that? It's like writing for the yeah. movies. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. So, so, so uh, uh, I guess in a certain sense, everyone has plausible deniability, <laughs> should they feel inclined to deny, but, uh, but the... Um, but what I've heard is that even, in this case, even the phrase axis of evil may have been a, a collaborative yeah. effort. Uh, and so I'm kind of curious as to uh, which of the three words, um, and I've got to say I'll be, I'll be disappointed if you just came up with the word of, um, 
But uh, but but well, what exactly? What, what what part of that you actually claim? If if you want to get yeah. into the details of, of that, I, I'm I'm happy to get into the details. I, I've told them told them elsewhere the, that. Section of the 2002 State of the Union began as a memo, uh, as, as speech State of the Union sections often do, um, and it was the assignment was explain, justify why, if the president wanted to extend uh, the war that was then going on in Afghanistan to include other um, other terrorist groups, probably Hezbollah, um, other uh, countries, uh, likely Iraq, perhaps Iran, um, how he would do it, um, and so I sort of I wrote a, a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs that were ended up being incorporated more or less holus bolus um, into the speech. You write all kinds of things that end up on the cutting room floor, of course. Um, in my draft, uh, the phrase I used was axis of hatred, because I was trying to make the point that all of these terrorist groups and these rogue states, they had a lot, obviously, they dif differed about, um, but they were prepared to make a common cause um, because they were united by their shared hatred of the United States. And that is, that's the fact of the matter, that we do know there's, um, and we knew then, of cooperation between Iran and North Korea, cooperation between elements of um, the Pakistani state and elements of the Iranian state, um, of cooperation between elements of the Pakistani state and other um, terrorist organizations. Um, that went then into the great writing for the movie's machinery and uh, was uh, Mike Gerson and I worked on it together and other people too, Matt Scully, John McConnell, um, president of a great team of writers. And the final draft, um, largely um, in anticipation of the pre president's preferences was changed from axis of hatred to axis of evil. Okay. Um, and I guess uh, the, kinds of, the kinds of problems I had with the phrase fall into two categories. Um, one is it's just kind of <clears throat> the accuracy of, of the phrase, and, and the other is, um, is the effect of using it, leaving aside the accuracy, the wisdom of, of using it. Um, right. and, and to take the, the first one first, um, I mean, Axis, I think, as commonly understood, implies a fair degree of unity and coordination among the, the uh, you know, the components, that, that, you know, that are in movement. I mean, the axis of the Earth's rotation, you know, the Earth is a, is a pretty unified thing. It, it's not a, not a coincidence that the eastern and western hemisphere, uh, you know, rotate in harmony. Um, and you know, notwithstanding, I mean, I mean, maybe you can point to 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 uh, an area here where where you know, uh, North Korea and Iran's interests have have have, have coincided. They, 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 there's even been you know uh, um, some degree of coordination. It, it seemed to me that the essence of the threat we were talking about, which was which was terrorism, um, if you want to ask, you know, what what unifies that problem? What what, what should we really focus our, our attack on? It was really nothing that North Korea and Iran and Iraq had in common. You know, I mean, uh, North Korea is very, uh, very different set of issues. Um, so, so for starters, I mean, you, you surely encountered this this idea that axis of evil implies a degree of unity that it, that is greater than was the case, right? Okay. Well. Um, I, I agree with you that there are a lot of things that are accurate that you don't say in government. So let, you're, I think it's a good division. Let's talk about accuracy and then later appropriateness and wisdom. Um, the most famous axis in history, of course, is the axis of World War II. Those powers were not allies in the way that Britain and the United States, for example, were. There was no coordinated command structure. Um, you know, J Japan never went to war with the Soviet Union. Um, according to Nazi r racial ideology, the Japanese were subhumans. I think they got promoted um, after Pearl Harbor. But uh, that, uh, and, and had they somehow won, uh, they would surely have come to war with one another. And indeed, Germany did invade Italy and um, ran it as an occupied country very brutally. Um, so it's not an, access is not the same thing as an alliance. It implies a kind of convergence, um, as, as happened then, of, of interests, in this case, some, some pretty nasty ones. Um, I think the record shows, and the more we learn, the more a, a, a very high degree of cooperation between both these regimes and the terrorist states, um, that the Iranians and, and, and the, the Iranian and North Korea missile and nuclear programs were profoundly synergistic. The North Koreans had the lead on missiles. The Iranians um, had the lead on all kinds of, uh, of other technologies that were shared back and forth. None of this could have gone anywhere without the involvement of the um, Islamists and the pa Pakistani military leadership who shipped out secrets that um, helped to short-circuit um, a lot of the problem of developing a nuclear weapon, um, that all of this ultimately traces back to designs that, that the Pakistanis got from the Chinese. 
Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a, there um, is a, there is a large part of convergence, and I think all of these problems had um, they they feed on each other. They absolutely feed on each other, and I think uh, within the case of Iraq, that. One of the things that vexed a lot of policymakers was they, if you project forward, the United States after 9-11 was clearly going to have a much more active and combative role in the Middle East than it had before. Um, and you had to wonder, well, how is that going to work if um, Saddam Hussein is at large? And he has a potential to make himself a, real, a much greater threat after 9-11 than he ever did before. You have to assume the price of oil is going to rise. So he's going to have more money to spend. Um, he's going to be broken out of the sanctions and um, uh, in, uh, inspections regime that was already that had already happened. It was happening. Uh, so uh, and um, he had cooperated with other terrorist groups in the past. And well, uh, well, but is, you would agree that, that that the extent of that was exaggerated, right? I mean, I mean, well, the, the Al well, Qaeda, the you know. For example, it's now common for President Bush to talk about Al Qaeda as if it was there. Uh, before and and the one uh, I think prominent kind of uh, uh, radical Islamist group um, that was there was actually in a part of Iraq that was beyond Hussein's uh, effective control, right? Well, well, Abu Nidal had taken refuge um, in Iraq, and so apparently had some of the, or at least one of the 1993 bombers. I mean, I think there is, a, you know, you know, one of the things I often find very frustrating is it obviously would be better and more convenient for the United States um, if these problems were smaller and separate. And if the United States got to choose which aspects of the problems it wanted to deal with. And the, I, let me just say here, one of my big problems um, with a lot of sort of the more liberal critique of what the Bush administration has done, and there's a lot, a lot of justified criticisms, but I think there is often an idea out there um, that only the United States acts and everybody else reacts. And everything you see, whether it's good or bad, is a reaction to something the United States has done. Forgetting things that in other contexts are supposed to remember, which is that these other countries and other groups have agency of their own. And it's dynamic, and they react to things. Uh, they react to the United States, and the United States reacts to them. Um, we were witnessing um, in 2000 and 2001, for example, the forging of ties between Hamas and Hezbollah under the auspices of Iran. That wasn't supposed to happen. Hamas, Sunni, Hezbollah, Shiite. But it, it was happening. Um, and the United States was confronting a degree a th rising level of radicalization in the Middle East, of terrorism, of willingness to resort to violence, um, in which connections were being forged right in front of our eyes. Well, yeah, connections were being forged, and they've been forged since, and, and I would argue that, that to a large extent it is a case of being in reaction to American policy. That is, American policy has facilitated the forging of ties, and al-Qaeda in Iraq is an excellent example. It, 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 it would not exist if we hadn't invaded Iraq. It does exist. It is affiliated with, with Osama bin Laden, the, you know, the, the original al-Qaeda. So, you know, we can argue about why, why the, the ties have continued to grow. But let me get back to the phrase, the axis of evil. Um, the... the uh, uh, and then I do want to address all, all, all the things you're, 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 you're bringing up, but, but um, an interest, uh, the reason I started out asking what evil means is, in a certain sense, I mean, we can argue about how much uh, coordination the word axis implies, but in a certain sense it's not that relevant because the word evil, in my view, implies the same thing. And, and this is, I think, a common uh, confusion. You know, when I, I wrote a piece in Slate, uh, you, you know, no offense, but mocking the speech you wrote um, <laughs> the, uh, after the Axis of Evil speech. O occupational hazard. Yeah, 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 for both of us, um, because they're, they're both on the record now. Um, and uh, Glenn Reynolds of Instapundent wrote a thing uh, in, in reply saying, uh, saying, look, this just shows that liberals don't take right and wrong seriously. And I emailed him and I said, no, this is a simple confusion. Evil doesn't just mean wrong. It doesn't just mean bad. You can believe in moral absolutes, as I do. I believe there is right and wrong. And I should add, Glenn, to his credit, agreed and posted like a correction and a kind of apology. But, but, but to me, the word evil doesn't just suggest... It, what the word evil says is that if you look at all the, the morally bad things in the world or at least all the ones you're talking about, they derive from a common source. So evil, and I think this is borne out if you look at the very origins of the world. What, what, what was Monarchian theology to begin with? It was, it was the idea that there is a unified good, a unified bad. I think they corresponded originally to the world of spirit and to the world of matter. But the point is, 
evil is a grand unified theory um, of bad. So, in a certain sense, regardless of what the word uh, axis uh, uh, is interpreted to mean, that phrase was saying, you know, it was saying there is an underlying unity here. And, and I guess maybe in a way our difference is, uh, I, I would be willing to, to, to see uh, a certain amount of underlying unity in the origins of terrorism and, and, and argue that that's what we should focus on. Uh, but I guess I don't, I, don't, I don't really see where kind of North Korea fits into my conception of what the, what the underlying source is. Um, so that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of part of my issue with the phrase. I, I also, by the way, this tangentially brings up a question. I, it, was, it was reported or speculated at the time that actually North Korea was an afterthought, that the focus of Bush was going to be, uh, his focus was on Iran and Iraq, uh, and, and certainly subsequent policy has borne that out. That is to say, that's where, uh, uh, you know, the general region toward which military force was, was projected, and that the point of bringing North Korea in was so that rhetorically we wouldn't seem to be saying that Islamic nations alone are evil. Yeah. Well, you, you raise a, a lot of... Um Interesting points. I, I, I probably won't do justice to all of them, but um, first, I'm, I'm glad you're giving me access, and I, I'm happy to uh, take up evil. As, as I say, when, when we did this, um, I always thought the term hatred was more precise, but the term evil had certain important advantages that need, uh, need to be considered. Uh, first, um, it really was true, even in all the shock and horror um, of the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there were very powerful voices from very smart people. Um, warning, uh, trying to contextualize this, um, trying to stuff this huge national calamity um, into the box of 50 years of, it, that, of pretty unsuccessful U.S. Middle East policy. And the president was giving voice, one of the things he was doing was giving voice um, to, I think, a profound national feeling that what had happened here, it, it was, this is not just the cost of doing business of a superpower, as somebody, I think, or other said after 9-11, that this is a, a profound violation of, of all human norms that deserves the highest level of response uh, from the government of the United States. There was, a, there was, I mean, we, we every, I, for all the talk about the need to avoid overkill, there was at the time a huge danger of an under-response, too. Um, and there are many voices that, that wanted to do that in a way that would have been, I think, injurious to the feeling of the country, and that the president is the um, political leader of the country, had to respond to. Second, I think the term had, had this advantage. Um, there are many semi-friends that the United States has in the Middle East who in talking to their own people, justify their relationship with the United States as a kind of relationship of convenience. And what they would sort of suggest is that while Osama bin Laden was sort of in the right, it was dangerous or in, inappropriate or un, um, unadvantageous to associate with the United States. And the president was trying to call call all of these semi-friends on that and to say, look, you, um, the, the days in which you concede the good intention, the way uh, that you concede the good intentions of of the jihadists, but just dispute their means. Those are over. Those are over. What we, we are calling on you to say, we are going to make this a moral line. And we're going to say that if you, as the government of Egypt or Saudi Arabia, if you want to be recognized by the governments of the West um, as a legitimate regime, you have to join us not just in condemning these people as, you know, excessively zealous, but is wrong. Their, their cause is wrong. And uh, that, that has been a tremendously difficult challenge because those governments have been very unwilling to do that, very reluctant and slow. And to the extent they've done it, I think the heightening of the moral language um, did force their hand. That, that, is a, that is a powerful fact. Well, um, I, I guess I think we probably both agree there was a danger of under-response in, in a certain sense, and we, and we disagree... Uh, on what the you know what the response should have been, what what was inadequately done. I, I would I would focus on things like um, developing uh, an international regime for effectively controlling weapons of mass destruction, for example. Um, something that you may say you don't oppose or even favor, but in fact I think there are trade-offs between cultivating that and the kinds of things you favor. But certainly, you the kind of response you favored and, and were, were in, you were in fear would not be, be done enough is, it is a military response um, to some extent. And there I, I, I see, in that sense, I see the, the wisdom of, of, of the choice of the word evil. Because evil just, just strikes a certain chord in people. Evil is, uh, you know, it's, it's this almost in 
ineffable core of badness that you must resist by all means and at all costs. It, 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 at all costs. It, it simply summons martial instincts in people. My fear was that too much in the way of martial instincts would be summoned. My own view, and I oppose the Iraq War, my own view is that uh, the subsequent events in Iraq have not exactly disproved my position, so I, I, I don't feel all that, that sheepish about um, repeating it here. But, but you see, that, that is my, my problem with the word evil is that it almost shuts down rational thought in people. You know, it, it, It's because my own view uh, of the terrorism problem is that uh, it's absolutely a profound moral challenge and, and, and it's bad, and it's morally bad, but it's the kind of uh, problem that has to be confronted in a very sophisticated way. And, and sometimes that involves um, not following through on, on retributive uh, instincts, um, especially when they're directed at somebody who's actually not, not closely connected to the, the uh, initial attack that you're um, retaliating for. So, uh, well, I've, I've talked long enough. you probably got something you want to interject, right? No, that, that's all interesting. Um, look. Uh, your response to an evil, obviously it has to be governed by wisdom. And, uh, I mean, the question of the Iraq War was, as I wrote at the time, it was a hard, it was a hard problem. Um, and although, you know, uh, I still think that given the information that policymakers had, given the balance of, of options they faced, it was the right choice knowing what they knew then. Um, you know, I think I think it's fair to say. Look, the way it's been executed, the cost it ultimately turned out to have, which nobody anticipated, uh, that calls into question the wisdom of going ahead. And I think one of the things that um, one of the complaints I often have is um, you have to make uh, you have to make ends means you have to fit your ends to your means. And uh, there was uh, there were, because in this case the means governed the ends. We the, we decided in advance on what the budget for Iraq was going to be, and then we just hypothesized that the cost of Iraq was going to fall within the budget. Um, and then that goes to a lot of things that are wrong with the way the Bush administration makes decisions. Things I wrote about in a book I published a long time ago called The Right Man about the closed circle and how if you had bad news you could you couldn't bring it. Um, th those are all fair points, but. I, I don't think it's true that the language of good and evil forecloses rational thought. I just don't believe that. Um, I, I think uh, I, the, there are moral relativists who think impulsively and quickly and haphazardly and with prejudice. Um, I, you see that some of that in the comments and some of the liberal liberal blog sites. I mean, those people are you know avoid the word evil, but they they make every other intellectual mistake as possible to make. At the same time, it's possible to think in terms of of good and evil and to make profoundly wise strategic uh, decisions and and. In a way, knowing what you are up against. You know, one of the things I was very influenced I think at the end of um, his book on the, the Russian Revolution, the three part series, Richard Pipes has a little essay on whether or not historians should make moral judgments. And he very profoundly argues that if, in the end, you're, you're not prepared to, that you do violence to the memory of, and the reality of things, that moral, mor morality is part of life. And if you're, if you're unprepared to recognize it, um, you blind yourself to a big part of life. Um. Okay, I mean, I, I should say, actually, I'm not against all use of the word evil. I actually wrote a piece um, for Foreign Policy magazine a few years ago saying that, you know, if you took the word as, as I think it should be literally taken, that is to say, look for a single underlying cause um, of, of kind of all great atrocities everywhere, all really bad things everywhere. If you really ser took a, seriously looked for a single underlying cause, the, the best I could do was say that whenever you see these kinds of things happening, whether it's Stalin or, or Hitler or terrorists who blow up the World Trade Center, um, it, it, one thing you see is either an, uh, an inability or unwillingness to, uh, to, to put yourself in the shoes of other people. That is to say, either the inability to acknowledge their moral status, that is to say, acknowledge that, the, that their perspective, their, the, their being has moral status, or an inability to just understand the way things look from their, their point of view, or an unwillingness to even do that thought experiment to try to figure out why they've done the things that they do. As I said, all those bad people I just named do that. I think all of us do that sometimes. And I think uh, American foreign policy has been guilty uh, 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 of you know, lacking a sufficient uh, uh, attempt, sometimes a sufficient attempt to understand why people 
uh, do, do, do things, to, to put yourself in their shoes. And that includes the enemy. That includes bad people, you know. For strategic reasons alone, you want to understand the motivations of people who are, in fact, your enemy. So I should say, I'm not quite opposed to what I would call a very nuanced use of the word evil or the idea that there is a single underlying cause of bad. But uh, in a certain sense, I guess, the, the kind of Bush administration use of the word evil, so far as I can tell, it remains unarticulated what the, the underlying cause of bad is. I suspect in Bush's mind, it's actually Satan. I mean, it is that kind of Monarchian worldview. Uh, and if he means that, I think he should say it. But, 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 but it, it kind of, so far as I can tell, it still remains a little bit of a... A puzzle. What, 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 if you accept this idea of evil, what is, the, what is the thing all these people have in common except that they're doing uh, you know, things you consider morally bad, which, of course, lots of other people do? But, uh, I mean, you, you say that, that Americans make mistakes by refusing to see things from the point of view of others. Um, and, of course, that, that is one grounds for mistake. But I, I would suggest that the history of American foreign policy shows that many more mistakes have been made by the opposite problem, which the specialists call mirror imaging, that is projecting onto your opponent, your adversary, your enemy, a th a thought processes that are your own. And Americans find it very hard to accept the reality that there are people out there who aren't Americans, don't think like Americans, don't care about money. Um, and so uh, uh, I mean, one of the classic examples of this was during the... Um, second half of the Cold War, when there meant the whole argument for arms control rested on the belief that it was going to be irrational for the Soviets to keep building missiles after they reached a certain point, and therefore they would have to stop. If you did the cost-benefit analysis, if you did the computers, and you did the computer modeling, it just made no sense, and therefore they wouldn't do it. But they did it anyway, because they didn't have those computer models, and they didn't do that kind of cost-benefit analysis, and they thought differently. They really did, as we have now seen opening the archives, they believed in using nuclear weapons as artillery, as tactical devices of war, and that's how their war planning was done. And we couldn't believe it because we didn't do it that way. And well, and actually, we, actually we have tact the idea of tactical nuclear weapons is part of our doctrine. Second doctor. half. I, I think second half. This is after 65. This is after the McNamara Revolution. And that McNamara really called a halt to the new missile construction. Um, and, and tactical weapons were de-emphasized because it just seemed it seemed stupid. It seemed to me, no, uh, and and they're, they're right. It is stupid. But uh, I'm not disputing that. My point is, don't that we assume that the Russians thought about nuclear doctrine the way we do. And in the same way, you see this, um, you know, the way a lot of people approach the, the Middle East dispute. I mean, it's just, it, who was it? Somebody said, of some, I think of Gordon Brown, that when he looks at a terrorist, he sees an unemployed person. That obviously, you know that killing people is a poor, inadequate substitute for a good job at good wages. Not everybody thinks that way. And maintaining the reality of some of those differences is, or avoid, uh, avoiding the failure, uh, uh, avoiding the mistake of not seeing those differences is every bit as important as avoiding the mistake of not seeing things from other people's point of view. Well, of course, your, your school of thought, I, I, uh, I, I mean, the... the, the um and, and I guess you you you, you don't uh, you, you don't avoid the label neocon. I don't know, but but has been accused of doing that very thing in, in the Middle East. That is to say, assuming that implanting democracy uh, in the Middle East is like you know organizing a, a chamber of commerce meeting in Peoria or something, notwithstanding the long-standing cultural legacy of a very different uh, approach to government. But uh, I, I, I first I. I d I accept the term neocon because it gets implied and it seems pedantic. I don't know. I, I don't think it's. A, I, I think sometime around 1985 it stopped being a very useful word. Um, I, I don't think that, that the, the people who argued for democracy in Iraq thought it was going to be easy. I think, I think the, the argument for democracy in Iraq was this. Saddam Hussein is a threat. Um, after 9-11, believed to be an intolerable threat. He's going to have to be removed. The United States is going to have to do it. There's every other way of removing that was tried between 1990 and 2001 failed. Coups failed, sanctions failed, they all failed. Um, so he's going to have to be removed by main force. Once the United States is there, once it's removed, what is it going to put in its place? Is it going to install a Hashemite king? That's, that's impossible. The United States can't go around installing monarchies. Um, it is going to have to leave behind a government, and the only kind of government the United States can leave behind is a democratic one. And so that's... that's the choice. And then, and then you know, maybe some benefits will flow from that. Maybe it'll change the region, and people allow themselves to hope that. But that was never the core of the argument. The core of the argument was the guy was a threat. He had to be removed. He had to be replaced. What are you going to replace him with? Some kind of elected government. That's what the U.S. always does. Okay, speaking of Iraq, I promised to get to the question of kind of the wisdom of using uh, axis of evil. And, you know, uh, here's, the, here's the question, basically. If you're going to invade Iraq, which I think Bush, Bush knew he was inclined to do, uh, uh, you know, from pretty early on 
including when that speech was delivered. Yeah. Um, it's the first thing he's, uh, the first meeting I ever had with him um, in the White House. He talked about that as one of the things he wanted to do before he left office. Granted, it was probably, I think at that point he thought about it for years, you know, five through eight, but it was very much on his mind from the okay. start. Okay. Uh, that, that dovetails with what I've heard. Um, so if you're going to invade Iraq, you know, obviously one, 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 one question you would face if you thought seriously about a post-war occupation, which is, you know, perhaps didn't get done, but if you were to do that, you would, you would say to yourself, now, wait a second, Iraq's neighbors will, of course, have the capacity to destabilize our occupation. No one will have a greater capacity than Iran, given its historical association with the Shiites, on, Shiites in Iraq. Now, so it might be smart to minimize the chances that Iran will, de will, will destabilize the occupation. Now, let's see, w what could make them highly inclined to, to devote maximum resources to destabilizing the occupation? Here's one thing. If you say... There are three countries that are the axis of evil, which, which means in anybody's language, basically, I think their existence cannot be tolerated. Then you actually invade the first one, Iraq, okay. Uh, you know, if I'm running Iran, uh, my mission one is to make life hard uh, on the occupation. So it just seems to me to, to say that it was not wise to send that signal in advance of invading Iraq is, is, is just a pretty gross understatement. I don't, I don't, am I missing something about the logic of saying that? Well, the United States, the President Bush didn't say anything um, in that speech about Saudi Arabia or Syria. Um, and yet, in the first year after the um, overthrow of Saddam Hussein, it is those two countries more than any other, that did more than any other to destabilize Iraq. Um, it was through their ter territory um, that uh, uh, that the, uh, the the weaponry flowed and the suicide bombers flowed. Um, so I, I don't I don't know that this is a case where um, the Iranians behaved as they did because their feelings were bruised. Um, they recognized what had President Bush had he lavished compliments on them in that speech. The Iranians would have recognized the underlying fact that the prospect of a Western-oriented regime in Iraq uh, was a great threat to them, and they would have recognized that whatever the president said. Uh, so I, I don't know that we paid any any price for that, and you know we had the advantage, as I mentioned before, of um, summoning, the, the, mobilizing the uh, spirit of this country, and also challenging um, semi-friendly regimes in the region to um, take a tougher stance against jihadist ideology. Um, yeah, I mean, as for Syria, of course, if anybody in Syria was reading the American press, they knew when we invaded Iraq that they were high on our list of invadable countries as well. Well, except they'd had Colin Powell jet to um, Damascus to reassure them that they weren't. Um, well, well I, I yeah, but I mean, it, it, yeah, this was not an official announcement, I mean, but if you read the press, a good piece by Nick Lemon in The New Yorker at the time, I remember, uh, and, and if you just read the tea leaves, and more generally, look, I mean, if, if a country like America look, had, invades your neighbor, if somebody invaded Mexico and, and w they were not an ally of ours, we would, of course, be destabilizing their presence, and we would kill people in order to do it. There can be no doubt so if you look at our, our history of reacting to, to things we perceive as threats in our hemisphere. So all of this should have been anticipated. So that, had, that, that, had, that had nothing to do with the speech, though. No, I, I was about to so say, that's, all that's of this should have been anticipated, reality. but it seems to me the speech heightened the motivation of Iran to disrupt the occupation. Not to mention uh, the, the fact that we also needed their cooperation in Afghanistan, and naturally this would diminish the incentive to, to uh, do the, that. But the only reason that that speech was given, I mean, governments, um, you know, the speeches don't just sort of pop out of the mouth of, the, of presidents. Um, the, uh, the reason that that speech was given because it followed on five months of intensifying and accelerating frustration with the behavior of the Iranians in Afghanistan. Um, that at, uh, that uh, what a lot of the governments of the region were doing, the Syrians too, um, in the early days after 9-11 was trying to pay just enough um, to see if they could somehow divert the American attention. But as the United States got involved in Afghanistan, the Iranians began to behave in ways that were um, very frustrating. That's why they didn't have a constituency. Had they been, in fact, helpful in the way that some people suggest they were, there would have been a huge constituency inside the government to say, look, let's continue to work with them. We're getting good stuff from them. They're doing this benefit and that, and let's postpone any quarrel we have with them down the road. The absence of, of that kind of resistance is a marker of the absence of this kind of cooperation that one would have wished to have seen. Well, I guess I would just say there, there are degrees of cooperation and degrees of resistance, and if you're, if you're planning to uh, invade a region, you, you, you want to m minimize uh, one and, and, and maximize the other. Sure, um, but, but, but 
but if you've got a problem where this, this hostility to you is very pervasive in the region, and if you've been, um, you know, I think the United States in many ways in, after 9-11, um, it had to pay all at once a price that had been, uh, with, you know, on which the interest had been accumulating for a generation, uh, that, that uh, it, the situation was bad. And, uh, you know, the, the options, I think, were, were, were largely bad. And if the results have been, uh, the results have been disappointing in many ways, as they have, because uh, we are now we're, n we're now working our way out of and trying to make sense of um, a problem that didn't appear in the invasion, didn't appear in the days after 9/11 that's been building for a long time. Okay. Well, I guess we could. Uh, I mean, we 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 uh, we could go on a long time about this, and and and. Uh now, we could move into the wisdom of the Iraq War, but that, that's probably uh, a bigger subject than, than, than we have time for. The, the, um, but this does lead us at least obliquely into another subject. Um, we, we said we talked about a little, which is, which is the whole question of, uh, of kind of, uh, you know, international laws, uh, cultivating a system of international law. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, let me quote from the final, final paragraph of, 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 of your book, um, An End to, to Evil. Uh, you say, you know, although you think uh, the UN has betrayed its original vision, you, you, you kind of subscribe to some of the values and, 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 you, and you quote them. A world at peace, a world governed by law, a world in which all peoples are free to find their own destinies. Um, I, I guess I'm curious as to what you mean by a world governed by law, because it, it's, it's, uh, it's my contention that, 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 you know, some things about the invasion of Iran uh, tended to undermine the, the goal of, of cultivating uh, a world governed by law. But anyway, what, what things do you emphasize when you, when you envision a world governed by law? Um, if you go into a store in Buenos Aires and are pay for something on Visa and are unhappy with what you get, uh, there are a whole set of mechanisms, and Visa is a kind of world government, there are a whole set of mechanisms to do justice between you and, and the shop. Um, if uh, two ships from two different countries collide in the territorial waters of a third, bearing goods belonging to nationals of a fourth and fifth. There are a whole set of mechanisms. I mean, to a great extent, uh, the upper one billion of our planet's people already live in a world governed by law. Um, if, you know, Luxembourg and the United States have a trade dispute, it's settled in courts, not by guns and force. And that's kind of my model for how someday the whole, the whole world should look like the way the world of the upper one billion uh, looks. Um, and in which not just, uh, I, I mean, private law is always more important than matters in public law. I mean, governments are not going to be, disputes between governments are going to be matters of negotiation. But they can be matters of negotiation which violence is ruled out, as it now is between the governments of the, of the upper one billion. Nobody worries about armed conflict between um, the, gov the governments of the, of the OECD states. Uh, but here's, I think, one of the ways in which I think those of us on the right who hold this view tend to differ from those on the liberal, on the left. Ironically, the, mo the model of international law that uh, many on the liberal side have is, is that the world is like a self-regulating system. It's like Adam Smith has applied to, um, has applied to uh, uh, diplomacy, that, that this system can somehow regulate itself. We give every country one, one vote to one nation, and it will balance itself out. Um, I take a Keynesian view of economic relations. This is a very potentially cha chaotic market, and it needs to have um, it needs to have um, it, it, it needs to have um, it, it needs to have its re limits recognized, and it needs balancers. It needs institutions to balance it. Um, and all of this, all of this world of law that we all take for granted since 1945, all rests upon the fact of American military power, uh, and uh, that greater world order in the future will always rest on power. And I think one of the things we say in, in an end is it may not always be America. 500 years from now, it may be Indian military power. Maybe the Indians will take over the job the way the United States took it over from, uh, from Britain. Who knows? But it, um, the, the systems do not work of themselves. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, uh, the... the um you know, and I agree that it, it may not always be the United States that is that is the dominant power in, in the world. And, and I guess I think one one case for constructing an effective system of international law, which you and I agree does in certain realms does not exist right now, um, is is that it's actually when you think about it, it's inevitable that the U.S. will decline in relative power. That is to say, if things go well, right? If prosperity spreads to the world, if the American model of free, kind of free markets and free minds um, spreads to the world, well, the prosperity of the world will grow 
relative to the United States, right? And, and, and so the U.S. You know, will be a less dominant power, and I think we should prepare for that day by constructing a system of international law. And uh, a question becomes, how do you go about constructing it? You're not going to get everything you want overnight. It's a, you know, a system of kind of true global governance, and I, and I, don't, I don't like the phrase world government myself. It'll, it'll, I hope, never be as centralized as that. But, uh, but uh, you know, a system of global governance is not going to spring up overnight. It's, it's, it's essentially a revolution in human affairs. If, it, if we're going to get there gracefully, uh, it's going to be something we have to cultivate carefully. And a big problem I have with the Iraq War is that uh, there was a, a moment we could have seized to nurture the further evolution of, of an important part of global governance, and, and it is the following. And, and in a way, this illustrates one of your points, okay. The UN demanded that Saddam Hussein let inspectors in and let them look wherever they went, wanted. He actually did that. And on the eve of the war, the inspectors were, in fact, lots of people have forgotten this, but on the eve of the war, the inspectors were, in fact, being allowed to look wherever they wanted. Wanted That is to, inspe say, inspect any facility, uh, which is what the resolution had called for. It's not to say they weren't, uh, Saddam Hussein wasn't showing any resistance on the margin, saying, no, you can't take my scientists out of the country, and so on. But the, the core thing that the UN demanded, uh, let them in inspect anything they want, they were doing. That was an amazing precedent. And as you suggest, that was done only with the strength of American power. Had those American troops not been there, it would not have happened. And... And, and, I, and I don't think that was Bush's aim to further the evolution of international law, but for whatever reason, he had done it. He had done it. He had set this amazing precedent. And that's why what I wanted to see was this uh, experiment in global governance succeed, which is let the inspectors keep looking. I thought, like you, that they would eventually find the weapons of mass destruction. But in any event, if what you do is say, okay, let the inspectors in or we invade, and they let the inspectors in, and then you invade anyway, that just undermines the potential uh, mm -hmm. evolution of, of what to me is a, it w was a very important and, and, and kind of a precious precedent. So uh, now, now I think you, that, when that, you think of international law, you, you maybe have a different set of emphases or something. Look, look I think that's a powerful point. And if um, with the foreknowledge of what was to happen, um, yeah, you do wonder maybe it would have been better, probably would have been better to let the inspectors go on for another six months. Um, it would have been expensive and you'd have had troops parked in the Kuwaiti desert, but it's also what, what has happened has also been expensive. Um, I, I want to just take up something you said at the beginning, though, which is the decline of American power um, is a medium, long-term, hypothetical situation. What we are facing as a short-term and immediate, something you know, you're going to see probably before your kids graduate from college, um, is the radical decline of European and Japanese power. And we're talking here in the 50s. I'm sorry, I missed that. The radical decline of European and Japanese power. And we are going to see that in the 15 to 20 year term. Um, that is, that's, that's what's coming up on the horizon. Um, if, you know, if you project out the world to, and I did this for the, the book I'm working on, I just finished now. Uh, you project that out the world to 2025, America's sh share of the world economy looks more or less where it was in 1985. Uh, what but the share that is held by Europe and Japan, that just collapses. And uh, the, 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 the thing to worry about is not uh, the United States needs to put institutions in place so that when the United States is weak, other countries will be nice to the United States. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, your attitude tends not to be a strong motive in international affairs. What will happen, the, 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 the thing we need to be focused on is what will happen when the core allies with whom the United States shares not just interests but values and culture, when they are so much weaker? Because they're going to be, and really, really fast. Okay, what's your answer? Um, my, my, my answer is that you, that's the, when I think about institution building, that's, that's what I think about. I worry about how do we get countries like India and Brazil to be vested in the international order in the same way uh, that uh, the countries of Europe and Japan have been. And so what I, I tend to think about this is finding ways to extend the sphere gradually um, and country by country rather than to build a global system. Um, th there is a global system right now. It works for the upper one billion. It works very, very well. Um, and we need to then get other additional rising members of the international system to buy into the system as it exists. One of the reasons the Chinese are such a, diplomat such a diplomatic problem is because they, they clearly are a revisionist power. They do not buy into the system. They want to change it. Um, and what we have to spend a lot of time working on is making sure that other other societies, Brazil and India being the two that 
spring to mind Mexico maybe, although um, they're, they're less of a factor. They, they decide, you know, the system that has served Japan, that has served Europe, can also serve us. We want into the system as it is. Now, that is going to mean accepting a certain quantity of American leadership because America is the provider of security at subsidized cut rate prices to the countries that participate in the American system. That's one of the things you get for buying into the system as it exists. Um, okay. The, the, uh, you, you brought up China, and I think, um, you know, one, one difference uh, between you and, you and me uh, and, and kind of your side and my side um, is how we handle China. And, and, and this gets it. There's a kind of an almost philosophical, well, no, I guess it's an empirical question. Maybe I hope so, because I'm, I'm going to argue one side of it. But, but there, there's a division that really uh, underlies a lot of the, the, the difference of opinion about how you, how you would approach the construction of a world of law. Um, and I think the surface manifestation of it is the fact that uh, neocons have favored a more antagonistic policy toward China than I have. I think the underlying... Uh, philosophical uh, difference is, is something you, you almost alluded to obliquely when, if I understood you correctly, you, you, you suggested that, uh, you know, liberals, uh, kind of modern, liberals in the modern sense, you know, people like me, are more of the Adam Smith view and, and you are more of a, a Keynesian. In other words, uh, there's a little bit of a paradox that, that you, you on the right mm -hmm. are, are, are in, in, along some economic spectrum. Um, Kind of more on the left, right? And and well, I'm saying in, in, when I it's an analogy, yeah. so let me be clear. Let be clear. I'm not saying that in economics that, that's true. I'm saying it, when you, if you think about this as a system and the way that the economic world is a system, it needs an external balancer. Um, add, um, that 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 uh, you need a Federal Reserve. You need some you know your lender of last resort. You need and somebody who ultimately guarantees and underwrites this whole international strategic system, and that's since 1945 has been the United States, right. and for the upper one billion, that, that's, that's, worked, uh, that's worked pretty well, and I think that's going to continue to be true for, for some time, and I think it's clear that the Chinese don't buy that, mm -hmm. uh, that they do not like the role of the United States as a balancer, uh, and that's why they're troublesome. I don't know that, that there is such a huge feel, I mean, I, I don't think, would you disagree that we should hope for the best and prepare for the worst? I mean, that, that's that's my philosophy. Uh, no, I'm for that. I'm for that. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know, I mean, put like that. I'm, uh, but but I didn't I didn't actually get to to the the, the philosophical um, difference uh, I was alluding to. By the way, I, I would agree. System of, of of law. Any system of law has to be backed by by the, the threat of the use of force. We are in a period uh, when that force may be disproportionately American. Um, but uh, again, I would, I would think that's not going to be the, the future forever. But let, let me get at the. That's going to be. That's going to become more true. No, that's. And I think that is an imperial. That when when you think about the, the capacity for our, the European states twenty years from now are going to have almost no capacity for armed intervention. When you look at um, their the obligations they are going to have in terms of pensions and public health to their very old populations. Um, they're all, uh, they're, uh, when you look at the slowing of their rate of economic growth, 20 years from now, I mean, Robert Shapiro, I think is a friend of yours, presented a big paper at a conference I was at recently, pointed out that, that at current trends, in 15 years, the average income of, the Europe of, of even wealthy European countries like France is going to be half the average income in the United States. Um, and they're going to have to pay all these huge pensions. So they're not just not going to have the fiscal room to be able to finance militaries at more than 1% of GDP. We'll be doing well if we can get them to stay at 1% of GDP. For well, okay, but I mean, China, you agree, is grow <laughs> growing in affluence. So, so let's, right. let's entertain the theoretical possibility that conceivably in 10 or 20, 30 years, China could be what even by your lights would be a constructive player in world affairs. And, and, and here is the, the, the kind of philosophical difference that I never got around to, uh, uh, to articulating. I mean, the, the Kane smith thing was just an oblique kind of uh, analogy. The, the, the fundamental paradox I see, one uh, fundamental paradox I see uh, with neocons, is that they actually have less faith in the power of free markets than I have. And, and by that, I mean the following. My own view of the current world, I think this is especially true in the modern uh, information technology environment. Okay, true. There's always been some, some truth to, this, to, to, to what I'm about to say, which is that if you want to have a prosperous free market system, you cannot have a highly, highly, highly repressive 
political system because a free market system has always depended to some extent on the free flow, uh, the relatively unhampered flow of information. I think it's not an accident the, that the Industrial Revolution picked up momentum uh, early on in Britain, which had relatively free presses, or that its predecessor in that role had been uh, the Nether what we call now the Netherlands, whatever it was called then, which also was a relatively open society. I think it's truer now than ever that if you want long-term prosperity, free market style, you're going to have to allow a certain amount of political pluralism. Now, if that's true, if that's true, then to encourage free markets in China is in the long run, in the long run, to be on the side of political pluralism. Now, I, I stressed in the long run, but I personally contend that the last 10 to 20, 30 years of China's uh, experience actually shows that this is working to some extent already. I mean, let's face it, China has become, in the last, uh, whatever, 30 years, it has moved from a communist economic system to something much more like capitalism as we know it, although still a relatively status form. And at the same time, it has moved from being totalitarian to authoritarian. That is to say, move toward freedom. No one denies that China is, is, is I think, politically freer now than it was uh, in, in the you know, old-fashioned Cold War communist days. So I okay, think... Let, let me let me stop sure. you there, Rob, because I, I think you're, um, and I recommend to everyone interested in this topic, a very important book by uh, someone I think you know, Min Shin Pai, who's at, the, who's at Carnegie, called China's Trap Transition. And one of the things, yes, obviously China today is a freer country than China was in 1975. But China today is not a freer country than it was in 1985. Almost all of the political progress happened in the first decade of the transition. Um, China today you know, uh, has the they streamlined um, a lot of their authoritarianism, and they move. Uh, yeah, they don't tell people what clothes to wear, and they're not trying to get rid of names and replace them with numbers in that kind of crazy Maoist way. Uh, but I don't see a lot of move toward political freedom over the past two decades. Well, see, I think you see something now you actually weren't seeing much two, two decades ago. Uh, I, I think it's true that the government, as a matter of policy, moved toward the toleration of political freedom, and then and then cut back when it became afraid of the results. But I think one thing that's happening now uh, is you are seeing more actual popular unrest, some of which bears fruit. That is to say, uh, the people are uh, resisting. They're, they're, they're resisting uh, when there are just uh, environmental outrages in their area. You know, awesome. you're hearing yeah. about actual yeah. kinds of peasant revolts, often facilitated by information technology in the sense that cell phones are used to organize uh, the expression of discontent. And you're seeing the government, I think, actually respond to some of this, uh, if haltingly. So I think at the popular level, there's a kind of technologically abetted unrest that, you know, I think the government could conceivably clamp down on effectively. But I think the price for doing so, if it wanted to do that nationwide, would be to effectively abandon or, or at least largely derail uh, the drive toward capitalist prosperity. So, so I well, think the government well, in the long run faces a choice between giving more freedom to people uh, and, and or just accepting uh, th that its dreams of prosperity are not going to be realized. Well, let, let me throw uh, two thoughts at you, not original to me, but I'm borrowed from, from, from Injun Pai. Um, uh, as China becomes richer, political power becomes more valuable. Um, and uh, the, the thought of losing that political power becomes more terrifying. It's also very po um, possible, if you know Chinese history, that this unrest, which is, as you say, intensifying, and it's got to do with environmental things and corruption and theft of what people regard as their communal property by powerful and politically connected individuals who don't have a lot of legitimacy, it could just end up in an explosion. Um, you know, I'm not a political scientist by training. I'm, I'm an a historian, and so I don't go in much for models. I just think with human affairs... We just don't have enough examples ever to build models. Um, that so uh, there's no telling. Um, but uh, so it was certainly true in the Anglo-American experience that prosperity rested on on a lot of political freedom, and the two have reinforced each other. Um, other countries uh, made different choices. Um, the Germans before the First World War tried to fuse um, tried to fuse political authoritarianism with economic dynamism, and they built then a political system that could only resolve its difficulties through a hyper-aggressive foreign policy that led to war and, and collapse. Um, other countries may try other things, and the Chinese are, are trying something. I don't know whether it will work or not. Probably not. But when it fails, I don't know that the failure will necessarily take the form of 
well, we hope, it could well take the form of something of, of aggression. It could take the form of civil unrest. Um, and so uh, prepare for the worst. Hope for the best. I think we may agree in the sense that uh, if you're saying what they're trying probably won't, won't work. If what they're trying is to combine an ongoing harsh repression with uh, free market prosperity, I agree that's not going to work. That, that's the source of my hope because I, I think they're pretty damn bent on prosperity. Um, and, and I would just finally say uh, th this issue of, of is it the case that countries that choose prosperity in the modern world must move toward political pluralism and, and possibly even ultimately democracy as we know it, that question's crucial. It has wide implications. It has to do with how we approach Iran and lots of things. So I would just encourage people to look at it very closely and not, not settle for, uh, you know, a a anecdotes uh, on either side of the argument. Um, the, the, now... Time is time is kind of moving on. Uh, I mean, this you know we, we could there, there's enough. We planted the seeds for uh, a number of possible future conversations. But you wanted to make a point, I think, in the realm of domestic policy, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the things that um, uh, I am very struck by, and I, as a, an avid viewer of, of, of uh, these dialogues and uh, big reader of the liberal left blogosphere, um, I, I, I I have been really struck by. Um, the, the change that has come to the other side, uh, the political other side. Um, and, I mean, I, a lot of that, I think, relates not just to the anger that many liberals feel against the Bush administration, but the optimism they're feeling about the outcome of the 2008 election, that, that I think many people on the liberal side see what is coming as their 1980 moment, a moment where you have an incumbent government that is in so much political trouble that the, out, the, the challenger party can move much more to its ideological extreme than it would ever have dared to in the past. Um, and there are, all, there are all kinds of signs of this. Um, uh, I, I was going to quote a line of, uh, from a post of uh, Brad DeLong, a very smart central, centrist Democratic economist, um, who, who described people like himself, whom he called Rubin and his spear carriers, that we will try to argue for fiscal prudence and stability in the councils of the Democratic Party, but I fear this is a bellwether that we will lose. And you see um, this right that um, all kinds of Democratic senators now paying at least lip service to this so-called fairness doctrine that is this radical idea about um, controlling um, radio and television. No one ever proposes to control the Internet where the left is having more success than the right and you know, punishing Josh Marshall for doing a better job than any of the people on our side are doing. Uh, and I, I, ha I have two questions about this. The first is, does this mean that, in fact, American politics are about to veer sharply to the left? Or, secondly, my more hopeful side, is this creating a political opportunity uh, for um, the rather beleaguered forces on the right that uh, at this moment that the liberal left is overplaying its heart hand and misreading the situation. After all, when, when the Republicans in 1980 followed Ronald Reagan further to the right than they'd ever dared follow, follow Gerald Ford, one-third of the country at that point described itself as conservative. I think it's still true today that only about one-fifth of the country describes itself as liberal. Yeah, um... A couple of things, I guess. Uh, I mean, how people describe themselves, I'm not sure is a very accurate gauge of what the actual substance of policy is. Um, it has more to do with how much taint has been successfully associated with one word, you know. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, as for why, uh, I mean, look, there, there's no doubt that there is a part of the, uh, the, uh, the liberal community uh, that is feeling its oats. Um, I personally think that that has more to do with technology. You know, the famous kind of, uh, well, cocooning is the unkind way of, of putting it. But, but certainly the Internet makes it very possible to associate yourself almost exclusively with like-minded people. And I, I see this actually in the conservative blogosphere uh, as, re as well as, as uh, you know, in, in, the, in, in parts of the liberal blogosphere, particularly, the, you know, the so-called net roots. Um, so I, I think this may, that may have a little bit of a... a a technological origin, and maybe you can see it on both sides. Uh, but you see the behaviors of the, of the Democratic candidates, I mean, who presumably have access to better information than they can get from surfing the net. I mean, they, um, they are being pushed, um, I think some, some of them against their better judgment, into, uh, you know, from, from 1980 to um, 1996, even to 2000, each Democratic candidate is runs a more conservative campaign than the one before. Until you, I mean, John Kerry is finally the culmination of this, who offers the most modest health plan that's ever uh, ever been authored, uh, um, offered, wants to have a Republican as his running mate, offers it to John McCain, surrounds himself with generals. Uh, 
and you, you can just you can just see a party that is step by step learning the lessons of the 1980s. And today, I think you see a party not just net roots, but um, office holders who are unlearning the lessons of the 1980s. And I mean, maybe they're right. Maybe those lessons are obsolete. Uh, but um, maybe what uh, I mean, I think the, the, that's to my mind the interesting question. I'm in my writing thinking is: Is this the Democrats' 1980 moment, or are they simply mis misjudging the? misjudging the numbers once again. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not really all that upbeat about the Democrats' chances in the election because I think when you look at the individual candidates, uh, there's, there's a better chance that the Democratic candidate will be someone who has problems in a general election than, than, than there is that the Republicans will generate. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of my guess. Uh, but, but I think you're right that the Democratic candidates are being responsive to what you describe. And I think they may be overestimating the power of the net roots. I mean, the net roots is good at mobilizing, uh, good at good at uh, uh, you know organizing, um, and they may have. I mean, only however many days ago the Democratic candidates flocked to Yearly Coast, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and of course, there's, there's always the problem candidates face that that on the left and right, which is to win the pri to win the nomination. They have to move away from the center. And then, and then for the general, you want to be back, back toward the, you know, you know, you want to move back toward the center and do so as inconspicuously as possible. But um, as for the policy question, I guess I would just say, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, health care, single payer health care, um, I say a couple of things. You know, the, it's hard over time to judge ideology in, in kind of absolute substantive terms because. The center of the, of the political spectrum just does change on certain issues. And in terms of health care, leaving aside single payer per se, I think the economic environment uh, has made people at large more amenable to the idea of the government playing some role in guaranteeing health care than it used to play because more, you know, employment is less secure than it is, than it used to be for more people. Um, and, and it's a real pain when switching employers or, or losing your job means losing uh, your health care. So um, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure that not, you know, some of the policy evolution you see in the part of the Democratic Party doesn't actually track what's, what's happening among uh, Americans. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, uh, I mean, you do have, what, a majority now of members of the House of Representatives who are in favor of single payer. Uh, Al Gore has endorsed um, uh, single payer. I think Hillary Clinton hasn't uh, yet done so, but she's certainly dropping um, a lot of hints about it. Uh, and uh, you see, um, uh, you see also the Democrats in Congress having run in 2006 as the custodians of fiscal discipline. In fact, showing that they are that, that they are interested in spending a lot of money. You have this S chip um, uh, proposal where, what, for 40 billion dollars, they're going to extend health, uh, federally subsidized health insurance to a population that is already majority insured. Um, so. It's beginning. It's, it's looking a lot less like Bill Clinton's Democratic Party, and, and looking a lot more like the Democratic parties of, of the 1980s. Now you're right. Maybe the country's country's changed. I think that's one of the. Th and in some ways, the country has changed in ways that are um, more favorable to Democrats. I mean, you can see that um, the rise, for example, of unchurched voters. They're, um, those are they're difficult to count. The government doesn't keep religious statistics, but one of the things I try to do in, in the book I just did is count them, and they do seem to have, have gone up. Uh, you know, you had um, a rise in the number in the portion of the population that is unmarried, unmarried as of age 30, childless as of age 40, and those people also vote Democratic, not Republican. Um, the number of people, um, you know, the number of people who describe themselves as very patriotic has been dropping, and. and Sorry to tell you this, but people who do not describe themselves as very patriotic are much more likely to be Democrats than than. Uh, well, uh, than, than are, it's true. It's, 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 it's not, those are Pew's numbers, not mine. Um, uh, and uh, so the country's changing, but is uh, is it changing enough that the kinds of things that you see on display in the Democratic Party give the Republicans an opportunity? And I th one of the things I've been struck by watching my own party is how disciplined uh, Rudy Giuliani has been at not being pushed off his game. And uh, I wonder whether that doesn't give some hope to Republicans in 2008. Uh, yeah, well, you, well I certainly, you, you know, you know more about uh, I think domestic policy than I do, probably foreign policy as well. So I, I think I'll, I'll wisely not not say a whole lot more. Uh, as an asterisk, I would say that the the, the thing I'm talking of the the idea of the government playing more of a role in um, providing health care may be an important part of keeping Americans on board 
uh, in terms of uh, accepting free trade, uh, because otherwise globalization may, may just seem, uh, you know. I completely agree with that. Yeah. I completely agree with that. But but one one of the things that um, neoliberals, I mean, to use a term that means maybe even less than neoconservatives used to say, was that, uh, the government should fund, but it shouldn't provide. That was the essence of the neoliberal idea. Um, and that's and that's the idea that single payer abandons. I mean, yeah, uh, it's, it's health care has become so expensive. It's what twelve thousand bucks for policy for a family of four at the median now. Um, that a lot of people are going to need some subsidies to purchase those. But whom do they purchase them from? Do they purchase them from a private provider, uh, subject to market discipline, or do they purchase them from a government monopoly? That's the argument. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm with you that, and I think one of the things that m where my party's had a real failure of mind, and there are a lot of places, a failure of creativity is a failure to recognize, look, uh, in a modern economy, everybody has to have some way of getting access to quality health care, and, and the people just won't tolerate it if, if they don't. And Republicans have to be um, ingenious about devising private-based solutions and not, and, um, not con constantly congratulating ourselves on what a great medical system it is because, at, yeah, it's true. It's like the Pentagon. I mean, it's, at its best, it's fantastic, but who can afford it? Yeah. Um. Okay, I mean, I mean, I would say that according, according to Mickey Kaus, uh, actually, the, if you look at the neoliberal uh, scripture, the, the biblical periodical of, of neoliberalism, and I mean neoliberalism in the sense of a domestic policy movement, not, right. not in its other usage, um, the, uh, that is to say the Washington Monthly. Uh, Mickey says Washington Monthly has always been for single payer. Well, well, look, Mickey is is the Muhammad and the Moses of neoliberalism all rolled into one. So I I, I hesitate to, to to challenge him on that. But my that my understanding had always been that what it was about was avoiding monopolies. And then uh, I mean I'm I'm imagining Charlie Peters is Jesus, but then the chronology is all screwed up, right? Uh, <laughs> well, right. okay, right. maybe maybe we'll we'll leave that bit of confusion to be dispelled in a later theology, conversation. <laughs> um, it's moving toward 96 degrees here, I'm told, and so this uh, this lack of AC is uh, is becoming something I'm, I'm I'm really really getting to be not entirely de delighted about, and, and and that's one of one of the reasons uh, that maybe I just as soon uh, I just as soon head for uh, like a supermarket or something right now, and and, and maybe wind this down. Um, but thanks a lot, David. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot we could we could talk about uh, in, in well, the future. There's really plenty left on the table. And, and I appreciate I'm, you taking the time. I'm delighted to talk. Okay. Thank you. I'm